Think Forward. Think Research Channel. It is my wonderful pleasure to be back here. Um, I will tell you that I had such a wonderful time the last time I, I did this, but there are so many new advances and it is my pleasure to make sure that you all uh, come away with uh, an idea that uh, we at Stanford and the Stanford Cyber Knife um, are um, continuing to forge the, the, the frontiers and, uh, and um, create new um, and exciting opportunities for uh, patients um, to have more improved lives. So this is just a disclosure. Um, the company that makes um, the CyberKnife, I am on their clinical advisory board. This is not a paid position, but um, I always make that disclosure. Um, being here at Stanford is a wonderful place of um, innovation um, and excitement, and I've been here for nearly 19 years, and um, I've um, enjoyed every single moment of it. What I'd like to do today is first do a general review of some of the, uh, the radiation terminology. Um, I know that um, there are a lot of terms that are, are um, spilled here and about. Um, I'll uh, do a brief review of what I mean by radiosurgery and how that relates to other forms of radiation. And then um, walk you through a brief, hopefully brief, um, evolution of the CyberKnife um, uh, image guided technology and then um, delve into some specific applications of uh, particularly the applications outside of the, the brain. So um, just a matter of terminology, when we apply uh, radiation treatment in the modern era, we're usually talking about three-dimensional conformal radiation therapy. In the remote past, radiation was delivered with very, very simple um, techniques um, and the toxicity of the radiation actually was fairly high. Over the last several decades, uh, we have modified those techniques um, and have been able to conform the radiation in a three-dimensional way so as to reduce radiation toxicity. Um, evolving from there is a technique called intensity modulated radiation treatment and I'll walk you through what that means and how it's different from three-dimensional conformal radiation. Um, and the topic for tonight uh, will be uh, specified um, based on these last several items, stereotactic radiosurgery. And when we use this type of technology outside of the brain, we say extracranial. Um, and then there's um, uh, a synonymous word that is sometimes used, and if I use it interchangeably with stereotactic body radiotherapy, I'll be meeting these um, uh, two uh, similarly. So with three-dimensional conformal radiation, this is just a, a slice on a CT scan um, through um, a sort of neck region. This is sort of near the teeth. This is the tongue. This is the spine. And so we've outlined an area that we think might be at risk for a tumor um, and shaded that in this orange color. And the actual tumor cells are outlined in this red. Um, these glands here are the parotid glands and they give saliva and so we would want to protect that. However, with 3D conformal or, or even two-dimensional um, uh, treatment, if you use very simple radiation fields, it essentially uh, will irradiate this entire area almost homogeneously. And so even with some of these advanced techniques, you could still give a fair amount of dose um, to the saliva uh, glands. One could bring in a few more radiation fields and reduce some of that dose, but this one just is for um, uh, pictorial purposes. Now, uh, comparing that to intensity modulated radiation therapy, it allows us, instead of giving the dose in a very homogeneous way through each beamlet, we actually can block some of the radiation dose, for example, to spare some of the radiation dose to the spinal cord and these parotid glands. And so, these are a bunch of different beam arrangements which when compiled together 
may be able to allow us to spare some of the radiation dose to those other tissues. And so that's sort of what we've been using um, a fair uh, amount of um, in radiation technology currently. So this is just to compare those kind of technologies with 3D conformal radiation treatment, really, and this is a, through a, a slice in the brain, um, using four different radiation fields. Uh, the main tumor is outlined here in red, but you see in this orange color, which is a fairly high dose of radiation, um, larger portions of the brain are irradiated um, in trying to deliver radiation to that tumor. When one applies this intensity modulated radiation treatment, uh, we're able to spare some of the opposite portions of the brain um, in uh, treating this um, target lesion. And so all of these colors correspond to very similar radiation doses. So you can see that here, this red is actually a very high dose. We're able to target the dose very um, precisely here to the uh, target lesion um, and uh, be able to conform the dose in the areas around that. With um, stereotactic radiosurgery, we're actually able to take that one step farther in the particular situation in which it makes sense. This um, particular uh, treatment is different from this, these two, uh, but it shows you how we're able to conform the radiation dose very, very precisely. This red area represents the tumor site. The green line represents the dose we want to give to that target lesion. And this blue line represents a lower dose, usually about 50% less than the dose at the center of this target. And so you can see that large portions of the brain are, are very much spared from radiation dose using this technology of radiosurgery. Now we can't apply this to every single tumor type, but um, it does allow us in certain circumstances to be able to target the radiation very, very precisely to the target lesion. And so in terms of um, differences between radiosurgery and radiotherapy, when we talk about radiosurgery, we talk about high dose per treatment. Here with radiotherapy, we're using usually low dose per treatment. And because we're giving some of that dose spread to other normal areas, um, we end up having to give a very, very small dose per treatment. So the normal tissues repair the injury in between each of the sessions. If we gave all of the dose in a single session, all that normal tissue would be um, irreparably injured. And so by virtue of sparing the dose, um, with radiosurgery, we're able to give the dose in a single or few sessions, so one to five sessions, rather than 30 to 45 sessions with conventional radiation. The number of beams that we use to actually um, uh, achieve this is also much different. We use about 200 beams, 150 to 200 beams of radiation, um, compared to the five to 10 beams with conventional um, uh, types of radiation therapy. The targeting accuracy allows us to be able to do, to do this. So with radiosurgery, and I'll show you how that, is, that can be achieved, uh, with radiosurgery, the targeting accuracy is very, very accurate within one millimeter. Whereas with conventional radiation techniques, because of the bulkiness of the, of the machines and um, some other features, um, maybe it's um, getting down to about two millimeters. So I haven't updated this slide. Two millimeters, at probably at the best with our image-guided techniques. Um, and maybe even up to 20 millimeters with very, very crude radiation techniques. So with radiosurgery, because we're able to apply a very high dose, our intent may be um, a little different than what we've conventionally thought of. With uh, conventional radiation, certainly we want to ablate the tumor, but oftentimes we're at a delicate balance between what the normal tissues can tolerate and what the tumor um, needs to be controlled. So oftentimes we're, we uh, limit the radiation dose. So uh, typically our goal with radiotherapy is to give a cumulative dose that will control the tumor and in many cases be able to eradicate it. However, um, with radiosurgery, we really do want to try to ablate that tumor. Um, and as I go through some future slides, I'll tell you ways in which we've envisioned this as being maybe a replacement for or um, a possible uh, ability to plant surgery in certain cases. So again, in terms of the terminology, intracranial radial surgery is uh, mainly confined to the brain area, extracranial in the body. We sometimes use the term SBRT or stereotactic body radiation therapy and stereotactic radiosurgery if it's given in one or a few sessions, 
mainly in the brain region. So this technique is uh, used to deliver a very high dose of radiation to a specific target um, and delivering a minimal amount of dose to the surrounding tissue and we believe it's highly effective in tumors. The main hallmarks of radiosurgery in general, and CyberKnife is just one form of radiosurgery, is that it's highly precise, uh, which means that one can continue to deliver um, a similar dose to a similar target in a very precise way. It's very accurate in terms of where you want to deliver the dose is where the dose goes within um, a error range of about one millimeter. There's rapid dose fall off at the edge of the target so that if a target is embedded in normal tissue that needs to be spared, um, that radiation dose is not um, exposed to those areas or very little dose is exposed to those areas. And then it's highly conformal and that, that also reiterates this sort of fall off, uh, meaning that the dose can conform to the shape of whatever your regular or irregularly shaped target might be. So in terms of a history of radiosurgery, a um, Swedish neurosurgeon, Lars Lexell, in 1951 at the Karolinska in, in Stockholm, Sweden, um, came up with the idea and coined the term stereotactic radiosurgery by um, being able to rigidly um, fix a uh, target um, by skeletal fixation. And so by doing so, by uh, putting a frame device um, screwed onto the head of a patient, um, and then using a Cartesian coordinate system directing uh, many beams of radiation to the target, was able to achieve this high dose of radiation to that target. They used an a, um, uh, orthovoltage and switched to cobalt radiation source in 1968, and this device ultimately led to what you guys may have heard about called the gamma knife. So the Gamma Knife was the first um, uh, sort of commercial radio surgery system. Um, and I will show you some of the precursors of that here. Um, so basically, this one was one of the very early kind of crude devices with their orthovoltage unit, where um, this was sort of locked onto the head of the patient in order to achieve that um, very accurate dose delivery. So ultimately, the Gamma Knife, which we don't see the full glory of, but it has these small circular collimators um, through this helmet. And what happens is you uh, target a, you put the patient here, you put the head um, in this frame device, and th these collimating devices will all be targeted to whatever specified lesion one has, and the dose will be delivered very, very precisely. And this is a very, very effective treatment. Um, at Stanford, however, or um, someone who came to Stanford later, but uh, Dr. Uh, John Adler, who spent some time with Dr. Lark, uh, Lexell in um, Sweden um, during a fellowship, felt that there may be some limitations to that device, um, the Gamma Knife device, felt that it was um, fairly crude to be putting frame devices on patients and thought, is there a way that one could get away from um, from using um, such an invasive type of technique um, in order to achieve and achieve um, the same degree of accuracy. So he spent a lot of years here at Stanford in the early 80s and, and, um, and ultimately um, with all of the innovation that's available here at Stanford and all of the bright minds in robotics and engineering um, came up with the idea that one could um, uh, circumvent the need of this fixation by using a robotic um, device and mini miniaturizing um, the conventional linear accelerator. So by that way, one doesn't have to deal with the radioactive cobalt, and so one can use the um, linear accelerator device. And I'll remind you that Stanford was also the very first place um, to, um, uh, to use a medical linear accelerator in the 1950s. And so I think this sort of builds on that sort of innovation here. Um, and so ultimately came up with this device in which this linear accelerator was made compact and mounted onto the arm of a robot and then use um, x-ray sources to image the patient rather than fix the patient um, in space to deliver the radiation. So what I'll do is I'll go over some pictures over time. This is like about 1994 when um, we treated our very, very first patient using um, uh, the uh, rudimentary uh, CyberKnife device, which was at that time called Neurotron 1000. Um, and it went through a few different um, uh, modifications, some different type of robot with, with different springs. Then um, this is probably about 2000, year 2000 version of this device. 
um, an updated robot, um, but still looking very mechanical and looking very industrial. And this is about 2003 when it became a little bit more sleek, <laughs> putting a covering on the ro robot, uh, on the linear accelerator and the robot arms, but still keeping this configuration of these 45 degree angle um, imagers during the course of the treatment. Um, these x-ray devices will, um, the, will uh, uh, shoot pictures of the, um, uh, the body part and then this amorphous silica detector will amplify that image and that process is repeated throughout the course of the treatment. That information is fed very, very quickly and compared to a digital image that would have been um, prepared during the treatment planning process and if there's any distortion or movement be or displacement between the actual image and the digital image, then all those corrections are made very, very quickly by the robot or the couch that the patient is lying on to maintain that one millimeter degree accuracy. And so this is um, the cyber knife that we have today. Um, the main changes are that the imagers are placed in the floor and uh, these images, um, it, so it allows a little bit more workspace for the robot to be able to achieve different um, positions. And I'll talk to you later about how that opens up some of the newer applications that we've been using. But essentially, the, the components of the device are the same. Now, I will talk about the synchrony camera later when we talk about tumors that move with respiration. So I know you can envision the idea that fixed objects can move fairly slightly, and if you image, if you take enough time, um, you can always correct for that. But what about tumors that move with respiration? I'll show you how this device can also track that movement. This is an example of what happens during a course of treatment. So the patient is aligned, and this couch automatically positions the patient where we want them to be. These digital images are what we would have had prior to treatment. These are the live images, and there is an alignment process that occurs very quickly before the beam of radiation is delivered. This process is repeated throughout the course of treatment, and those 150 or 200 beams. So it may not um, image after each beam if the patient is relatively stable, but if they are moving, then uh, one images more frequently. One might ask, what about the radiation dose? It turns out that with the silica detectors, it amplifies the x-ray images, so the cumulative amount of radiation that's given really is much lower than even one CT scan. So um, given that the high dose of radiation that's delivered to the target is much, much more, uh, we've confirmed that this is um, a safe delivery. So the main features of the um, CyberKnife are that it's non-invasive, it allows us a bit more flexibility. So with the frame device, one would have to deliver all the treatment in a single session. Who would want to have a frame on their head for you know, three days? So uh, with this, opening up the platform, not having the rigid device, one can deliver the treatment over multiple days. Um, and it then opens up the platform to be able to treat not only things that are in the head region that can be fairly easily um, fixed, um, but also outside of the brain. Um, the accuracy is comparable to those frame devices, and we've done uh, uh, many of those studies here at Stanford to confirm that. Um, the non-isocentric delivery allows us to keep the dose very conformal around the target and uh, without compromising the evenness of dose throughout the target. Um, and as I mentioned, we can uh, treat tumors that move with respiration, and there's no need to dispose of any um, radioactivity such as, the, um, the, as with the gamma knife. So, our history, 1994, as I mentioned, we, um, the CyberKnife was introduced. We um, very quickly after the uh, introduction began testing the hypotheses of whether or not we could use this outside of the brain and uh, started our first spine treatment in 1995, quickly uh, moved to pancreatic tumors um, as a proof of principle that we could treat tumors that move with respiration. Um, and then have evolved to treat uh, more lung tumors. It started in 1999, and this program has um, uh, grown dramatically and has caught on around the world, um, and so um, that's a very fast-growing application. Um, the device itself was FDA-approved in 2001, 
So all the patients treated before that were definitely treated on protocol. And actually since then, we've, treat, we've kept our protocols open so that we can learn um, about what the optimal use of the devices are. In 2003, um, and I think that might be the year, 2003 or 2004, we gave our talk here, and we were just beginning to investigate the use in prostate cancer, and a lot of people were very interested in, in that potential application, but at that point in time, I, I really had to hedge and say, you know, I don't want 100 phone calls about prostate because we're really not starting yet, but now I can say it's okay. <laughs> okay, so um, prostate um, cancer. Um, liver tumors, we uh, began in 2004. We installed our second unit at Stanford because um, the program had become very, very popular in 2006, and so now we operate two ongoing units at our institution. And then I'll talk to you about some future applications where we go from here. This is just a general trend. In the early years, we really didn't treat very many, many patients because it was under protocol and still investigational. After the FDA approval, we began to see our numbers increase significantly, necessitating the second device. Now, we've pioneered a lot of different types of treatment. This talk today is about our treatments of, of cancer, but just briefly, we've um, pioneered treatments for conditions such as trigeminal neuralgia, which is a very painful um, uh, syndrome emanating from a sensitive um, nerve here right off of the brain. And uh, we pioneered a type of treatment different from what they had been doing with gamma knife and uh, found that we could get much more pain relief with this technique. Um, and then some benign tumors of the inner ear where patients lose their hearing and who, if they're operated on, they oftentimes will lose their hearing and even facial nerve function. We um, pioneered a technique uh, whereby we could preserve hearing and we've, uh, we have very, very long-term follow-up of that, um, confirming um, those tumors uh, can be um, adequately treated. Tumors very close to very sensitive nerves that would not have been able to be treated with a gamma knife procedure. Here's a, the vision nerve. Uh, right uh, in between the eyes here um, and the pituitary region, a tumor there that basically nearly touches that. We're able to give the green dose to that target and then have about 50% fall off even within this one millimeter um, of the proximity of this, of this uh, nerve and be able to spare vision. As shown here, uh, basically this shows you that after the treatment the patient's vision got better. Um, and the tumor got smaller. So what we'll talk about tonight, though, is um, focusing on our applications in cancer. Um, and so these represent the most common applications that, we'll, uh, that we use today. Um, tumors, brain metastases, spinal metastases, lung tumors, pancreas tumors, liver tumors, and prostate cancer. With regard to brain metastases, this is one of the most common intracranial tumors in adults. Um, it occurs in cancer patients, up to about 15 to 20 percent of cancer patients will develop brain metastases at some point, and so that's over 100,000 cases per year. Over 60 percent of these might have lung masses as well, so sometimes when we see this, we also check the lung. Now, for these uh, types of tumors, if left untreated, most patients will succumb fairly quickly, um, and if radiation is, is delivered, um, it, uh, we can extend um, the survival to about four to six months. Um, and in select patients who are candidates for, for surgery or who have only a few um, tumors, um, they actually may live a fairly long time. These are just general numbers for certain patients with specific types of tumors who may even live much longer than this, even with brain metastases. So we felt that this was a very reasonable application uh, for um, the CyberKnife technology. And one of, the, one of our goals was to see whether or not we could use this even more uniquely than others had been using um, uh, this um, similar kind of, kinds of technology. So there's a big study um, that compared patients with a few tumors um, with uh, surgery and asked if you gave surgery and then had radiation afterwards, could that improve outcomes? And it turned out it did. Um, but one interesting factor was that um, recurrence right at the site of the um, tumor resection, if you did just surgery alone, um, this represented nearly 50% of the recurrences. And, but one could reduce that if they gave the whole brain radiation down to 10%. But we said to ourselves, does that patient definitely need whole brain irradiation? Because sometimes the effects of whole brain irradiation may be pretty striking, particularly in a patient who might live a long time. So we thought, since the pattern of recurrence 
is largely right at that site where that tumor was removed, perhaps we can deliver, use this radiosurgery technology to deliver the treatment very precisely to that area. And if the patient needs to get full brain irradiation at some point later because of the development of other tumors in other parts of the brain, then we can apply that. So this is what one would do. Here's a tumor in the center of the brain. And uh, this has been removed by surgery, leaving a little hole there and some enhancement. And what we did is we delivered a radiosurgery plan with this green representing this very high dose, our ideal target. And um, we were able to confirm, and my colleague, Dr. Soltis, um, who works under me, uh, published this uh, last year, showing that we can get as good um, local control rates as that other study did with uh, the full brain. Now, what we don't do is we don't end up uh, um, uh, uh, changing the dynamics of what happens outside of, the, of that area, but if the patient developed three months or six months later, other tumors, we could apply this techn technique again. So many patients have, are able to defer whole brain irradiation either indefinitely or for a fairly significant amount of time. So we've made, a, I think, a contribution um, here. Uh, in terms of the spinal metastases, this is another very active area. The spinal column is the most common site of um, bone metastases, and it causes a lot of pain and neurologic compromise particularly if um, it starts to press onto the actual spinal cord. Only isolated cases are actually treated by surgery, so radiation typically is the treatment of choice, but conventional radiation courses last about two to three weeks. Um, and uh, there, are some, there have been some studies that have looked at giving just a single large dose of treatment uh, versus multiple tr multi-treatments. They find that they actually get the similar pain relief However, um, despite which technique you use, there's a fairly high recurrence rate of the pain. And that's because the radiation dose is very, very limited. Um, and because you're giving the radiation um, through and through, the amount of dose that it really takes to keep that tumor under control for a long period of time actually ends up being prohibitive um, because of the normal tissue exposure. So our goal in treating spinal metastases was um, to increase the biological effectiveness of the dose. So to concentrate the dose so that um, even though we're giving it in a one or a few sessions, uh, a shorter amount of time than conventionally, that the effective dose of radiation would be higher. And uh, our, uh, we proposed that we would get similar pain relief or improved pain relief um, and without having to retreat patients as uh, we found ourselves in before. So this was a review that I did um, some time ago um, with 126 patients with 162 spinal metastases treated over five sessions, and we followed them very closely every three months. And we had tumors representative, represented in all areas of the spinal canal. And many of the common types of um, tumors, metastatic tumors from breast cancer, from the kidney, from the skin cancer with melanoma, lung tumors, were all represented. These were the highest incidence. So what we found were 87% actually had significant symptoms and uh, most of them actually had pain as a component of that symptom. Even though we initially developed our protocol to treat spinal metastases that were isolated to one or a few retrieval areas, what we found were we were getting referrals from all over the country uh, because patients had undergone prior radiation, could not get another course of prior radi um, conventional radiation, and were still having pain, and so we were being asked to actually treat these patients. So it turns out in the end after our um, uh, revisions, we actually included these patients who had had prior radiation, and in the end, nearly 75% of all these patients had prior radiation treatment. So the important goal was to determine that this was safe and that there was little toxicity, uh, particularly to the spinal cord, um, in avoiding a patient from being paralyzed. And this is a, a typical type of treatment. So instead of giving the radiation dose exposure um, to, this is a blown up very heavily, but this is sort of through the chest. This is the air cavity, we call it trachea, the carina. Um, and this is a tumor in the bone of the spine. So um, this green, this common theme that the green is our target dose um, around this tumor and vertebral region. And then tightly conforming the dose around the spinal cord so that by this dark blue line is only 25% of what the maximum dose was. Um, and being able to achieve that 
And we delivered this over three treatments, gave eight gray times three treatments. Typically when in the outside, if one was giving this with conventional treatments, one could have given eight gray times only one dose um, if you treated it uh, through and through because of the toxicity. So we were able to give three times that dose um, because we're able to spare the dose to the spinal cord. And so what we found um, after a mean follow-up of nine months, and again, that one's just an indication of, of the severity of this condition in that I told you earlier, the median survival is somewhere around six months or so, but um, our median follow-up was about nine months. Um, there was uh, several patients living out to almost four years with um, metastatic disease in the spine. Um, so no treatment-related death. 87% of these symptomatic patients actually had improved symptoms. Only five patients out of this group of patients had, 126 patients had um, any worsening symptoms. So we felt that this was a very, very um, uh, excellent treatment and um, definitely proved our proof of principle. In the, in the time since then, some of our other colleagues from other institutions have also um, published similar results. And some of these are with the CyberKnife and some of these are with other treatment devices such as the Novalis. But again, uh, pretty good pain relief and quality of life measures. So let's move to lung tumors. In terms of background, standard treatment for early stage lung cancer is surgery. Um, and up to 70% of these patients can be cured by surgery. But about 20% or more actually can't tolerate surgery because of medical conditions, heart disease, um, lung disease, and so surgery would be very, very difficult. So in that group of patients who um, cannot be operated on for medical reasons, we have standardly used the alternative of conventional radiation. Again, in this recurring theme that uh, the sensitivity of the normal tissues kind of limits the amount of dose one can give. And so historically, um, the uh, overall treatment outcome and survivals actually were only about 10 to 30 percent less than a third of patients having good, um, reasonable survival. And in terms of the tumor being controlled locally, even if the patient didn't die immediately, only about two-thirds of patients um, achieving some degree of local control. So clearly a place where there can be some um, improvements, um, uh, improvements upon the treatment. And so this one just shows you patients treated with radiotherapy and patients not treated with radiation treatments in terms of their general survival. So it, it's, even though this one shows some statistical significance here, probably at the median time frame, as one can see, this has a lot to be desired. So about 14 to 21 months. Now the potential advantage of the stereotactic in this setting is a highly focused radiation concentrated on the small tumors, single or few treatments, high dose per fraction, very precise delivery using this image guidance I showed you. And even though this historically was confined to the brain, we could move outside. So in terms of our process, for these tumors that move with respiration, we place little metal fiducials into the tumor using some imaging uh, techniques. And I'll show you an example of that. Then also get some information of the fourth dimension called time to see what's going on as uh, the patient is breathing. And uh, we incorporate that in our radiation planning so as to be able to really hone in on just the tumor and not the normal tissues. So this is an example of the fiducial markers, what it looks like here very, very, this is in relationship to a penny. So you can see it's very, very tiny. Um, and this is the scatter one sees from that fiducial that's placed in this lung tumor. Fiducials are made of gold. And so this one was just a brief picture of how that's placed a needle through the chest wall uh, by our interventional radiologist and then placed um, directly into this tumor. And here's another type of fiducial. This one's a platinum fiducial that's made more like a, a coil. And it's present here and here and here. Okay. And that one also can be used to, um, as a surrogate marker um, to uh, be able to see this on imaging. And this is what happens with the tumors that move with respiration. Um, it's a similar technique as what I showed you before, where the images are taken through um, while the patient is lying there. But as you can see, this patient is freely breathing. Uh, and with free breathing, things move. And so how quickly can you check these images and make sure that um, you've uh, compensated for where the tumor really is, because one could imagine that by the time you 
process that information, the tumor is moved to a different spot. So what is unique about the CyberKnife system, much different from other systems, is that we don't make the patient hold their breath and keep, keep it there so that we can image and do the treatment um, in one breath hold. That's one's a gating procedure. This one's actual tracking. Um, so it develops an algorithm that compares um, the movement of those internal fiducials and compares it with the movement along the chest wall and creates a predictive model. That predictive model then allows one to be able to um, track this. And it's updated throughout the course of treatment because one could imagine that the patient can breathe more shallowly or deeply after certain periods of time. And so this is what allows, even during this kind of treatment, that maintenance of about one millimeter accuracy um, in treatment uh, delivery. So um, we conducted a phase one, two study, which really is a study looking at safety and whether or not it's effective in localized non-small cell lung cancers, as well as um, tumors that had spread to the lung as long as they were only a few or isolated tumors in mainly patients who were not able to undergo surgery. In our early days of the treatment, we did have a breath holding technique. And so we did uh, begin this with a single um, dose given it at one time. This has evolved over time, but in, in terms of this study, 33 patients with a median follow-up of a, a year and a half, we found that small tumors actually had 100% local control, so didn't grow after that, but um, slightly different for slightly larger tumors, and tumors that had spread to the lung from somewhere else were a little bit more difficult to be controlled, but still had pretty reasonable control rates of about 60%. And overall, survival was about 85% for the patients with the primary lung tumors, but only 56% for the metastases because most of those patients would succumb to other metastatic lesions. This is an example of the fiducials that are placed in and around the, the tumor. And we allow a little bit of margin of some of the normal appearing lung because we know the tumor cells don't stop immediately at the edge of the, um, um, of the target lesion and we're able to conform the dose so as to spare dose to normal structures like the esophagus, the airway, the spinal cord, and so they get very, very little dose. And here's an example of, of outcome. This is before treatment. I showed you this panel prior, previously, with this fiducial and the lung tumor. And then after treatment, essentially this was considered a uh, complete response, which means uh, this is only sort of scarring from the radiation um, that's typically seen but the tumor itself has been completely gone, and this was proven by metabolic imaging of, by PET scan as well. So in this study, uh, these are just some of the results. The smaller tumors, just reiterating what I showed you earlier, smaller tumors were uh, controlled well. The medium-sized tumors, not as well, but still very good. And the uh, tumors that got higher dose, in this, the medium-sized tumors that got higher dose, they were controlled a little bit better. And uh, this just talks about the ones that were primary versus the uh, metastatic tumors, and similarly here. So in addition to what we've been doing here at Stanford, other groups have been using the stereotactic body radiotherapy technology and addressing lung tumors. And there was a very nice study in Japan that looked at a group of patients that were inoperable, but they also included patients who were operable, which is a pretty, you know, um, enticing for us to be, begin to uh, make that stretch to say, does radio surgery, can it actually supplant surgery? Uh, so far, we've been managing most of our patients who could not undergo surgery, but how can we com actually compare this to ones that actually um, can undergo surgery? So with more than three years follow-up in more than 257 patients, they found that if they gave a high enough dose, the local control was 85, 84%. With conventional radiation techniques in these types of patients, I showed you that the good controls were about 10 to 30% after um, uh, conventional radiation. And this is a number after about five years. So this is very, very striking. And in the inoperable patients, the number was about 35% at five years rather than that one to two years that we, I told you earlier that was about 10 to, 10 to 30%. So very, very compelling data, um, much higher also for um, patients with operable tumors. 
And these are those data which um, concluded that local control and survival rates seem to be superior um, using stereotactic radio surgery, most certainly compared to conventional radiation. So I think we've come up with a technology and a technique that probably is going to be a, a fairly good close to home run, at least for these patients. There is a trial that's open and it's one of the first of its kind. It's sponsored actually by the company that makes the CyberKnife and it's going to be comparing CyberKnife technology to surgery in patients who actually have operable lung cancer. So this is a very intriguing trial. It's one that will serve to give um, definitive data, I believe, on whether or not radio surgery can uh, supplant uh, surgery in this, in this setting. So let's move on to other tumor types, um, pancreas tumors and liver tumors. This is just sort of what's been going on at Stanford. This one was our early number in 2007, which goes up. Um, but in any case, we've been um, pretty active in the pancreatic cancer cases as well. As I mentioned to you earlier, this was a treatment that we initially use as a proof of principle. Um, does, can we treat tumors that move with respiration? And um, we showed that to be true, but in, um, we also gained some additional knowledge um, and insight on whether or not we're a actually able to help patients as well. So it turned from a feasibility to actually an efficacy study. This one's just a busy slide, just giving you a little bit idea, just looking at these numbers. These numbers over here are from a lot of radiation and chemotherapy trials for pancreatic cancer. And I think I don't need to reiterate because I know it's in the popular press about how horrible pancreatic cancer can be. Um, but it turns out that about a quarter of a patient's, quarter to a half a patient's, will suffer some kind of local um, failure. So it means that the radiation is actually important in the, in the disease um, and this contributes to their pain. Um, and so what has been conducted here at Stanford, paying close attention to these last two last three lines, my colleague, um, Dr. Albert Kuhn, has supervised at least three clinical trials in pancreatic cancer. First, our first phase one study just showing that CyberKnife was feasible and showed that actually in that group of patients they had no local failures over that short period of time. And then in the phase two study showed that it was very um, effective and only 6%. So compared those numbers and then in this um, second one where he added additional chemotherapy showed no local failures in that group of patients. Um, and I'll say also that quality of life in those patients was also um, significantly improved. Many of the patients still succumb to some um, systemic um, disease um, failure in other parts of the body, liver and lung. Um, but this one was very, very encouraging that as a component of that patient's quality of life, that radio surgery could be effective. And this is just an example of sort of what we do, delivering the radiation very precisely to the target tumor. It's very close to the bowel. This is the duodenum which is very, very sensitive to radiation, but we're able to conform the radiation dose so that it avoids all of this bowel, avoids the kidney, and even the bowel that's actually in contact with the tumor. So um, able to deliver that in one single dose. So the major conclusions from these studies was that just a single dose actually was feasible and no significant toxicity. And from the later trials, local control across um, four independent studies, I think we only listed three, uh, was about 90%. And that stereotactic radio surgery seems to decrease the pain and prevents some, some of the complications like the gastric outlet obstruction. And it's only one day treatment. So it's one that we are continuing to look at for our patients. Other emerging indications, I told you that we started a liver program in 2004 and we've completed um, at least one phase one study and are slated to open an international cooperative uh, group um, study looking at liver tumors as well. And also in rectal cancer, uh, we may be considering some treatments and in um, esophageal cancer. So this one is just a a uh, poster that was recently presented at one of the national meetings with some of the results of this treatment for liver tumors. Now it turns out in liver we can actually treat fairly large tumors and so that's one thing we learned in our phase one study. So we're able to treat these. They, uh, these tumors respond very, very um, quickly and nicely to radiation, both um, metabolically and clinically. And so what we showed was there's excellent, very excellent local control of these tumors several years even after the radial surgery is delivered. So 
Switching to, I believe it's going to be our final topic of prostate cancer. This one's just a uh, picture of uh, sort of what the patient might feel like, but uh, <laughs> to target the radiation very, very accurately. <laughs> Hope patients don't feel like they're <laughs> in that situation. But, um, but the, in the area of prostate cancer is, is pretty interesting because uh, there is no limit to the treatment options that are out there. So um, patients can undergo um, surgery, a radical prostatectomy, and now um, some devices uh, such as the da Vinci or lap laparoscopic techniques are available, so there's multiple surgical uh, procedures. Um, then there's um, some radiation procedures, the IMRT I talked to you about earlier. Prostate has been one of the very favored sites of using that technology, and patients have had extremely improved outcome compared to, compared to um, many years ago where you know, they'd have a lot of problems with um, diarrhea and, and urinary symptoms. Now with IMRT, many patients will go through those treatments uh, for seven to eight weeks without much in terms of symptoms. Then there are brachytherapy techniques where either seeds are placed within the prostate gland or temporary catheters are placed throughout the, through the perineum into the prostate gland. Not a very comfortable procedure. Um, requires anesthesia and patients come uh, and have that treatment um, about uh, three to five times. Um, not a comfortable procedure, but one that can be effective. So some of the radiosurgery um, data that I'm going to present um, is really comparing to what the results of some of these established techniques are, and I think they're very encouraging. And then there's some investigational techniques like cryotherapy. So. In these treatment options, there's more than 220,000 new cases per year, and about 40% of these patients will end up choosing radiotherapy. So we asked ourselves whether or not with CyberKnife we could actually improve upon what's going on with um, conventional radiation. And this is just a conventional radiation course. I told you about eight weeks. Um, and over time, because of IMRT, we were able to escalate the radiation dose much higher than we were able to many years ago because of the toxicity and actually have been seeing that we can get better control. So the, there's a dose response relationship. If you can go higher in your dose, you can probably control the prostate cancer much better. Here's an example of just showing that we can achieve the same dose distributions as the IMRT using the CyberKnife. So I won't go through it in detail, but basically we can achieve something very, very similar. One thing we've learned about this is uh, what I've just talked to you about is that you really need, in order to get control of prostate cancer, you need higher and higher doses. And that's all this slide says. It's a bunch of mathematics on here, but um, it, that's basically what it states. Now, there's also a unique biology of prostate cancer that has just been um, sort of uncovering over the last several years. Turns out that we believe that prostate cancer is more sensitive to the dose size rather than um, just the total dose uh, compared to other tumors. And we believe that there may be improved cure rates and lower toxicity if you give fewer numbers of large doses rather than um, a large number of smaller doses, a process we call hypofractionation. And we believe that if we can achieve a number that's equivalent to about 90 of the conventional treatment um, dose, that we can achieve excellent control rates and cure rates. So that's where radio surgery comes into play. So this is ideally suited for that, giving one to five large treatments. And radio surgery, in this case, would also replace HDR, which is that high-dose brachytherapy where catheters are placed in. And you can use it with the CyberKnife, or um, there are other techniques of using linear accelerator-based radio surgery. And it's non-invasive. I did not include the slide that shows you how invasive the other tumor is, so, I mean, the other um, procedure is, but um, just suffice it to say that this is much less invasive because it only requires just the placement of those fiducial markers, uh, but not catheters um, through the perineum and anesthesia. And so this one uh, was a courtesy of one of my colleagues up down in San Diego who has also been showing that the radiation doses achieved by these, dose, these radiation dose placed directly into the prostate, um, we can actually achieve that with the CyberKnife. Um, and this one was very, very hard for people to believe because how can you get much better than putting the dose right in the prostate? 
And so it turns out that with the newer technology of the cyber knife planning, we can actually achieve a dose distribution that looks just like having the radiation seeds and catheters in the prostate. So this is very encouraging and there's a study that's um, ongoing now looking at, um, compare, um, at this technique as well. So we can increase the dose very safely, hopefully keep the same late effects um, and reduce any acute effects and reduce the treatment to a week and a half. So this is Dr. King's work here at Stanford, Dr. Christopher King, and he's delivering the dose in five fractions. He pioneered this work, was the very first person to deliver radio surgery for prostate cancer. And so everyone has been definitely awaiting his publication of this, and I'm happy to say. Um, and this was a preliminary um, uh, review uh, up through August, uh, 45 patients up to almost four years follow-up and really showed that the prostate-specific antigen, which measures the activity of prostate cancer, quickly goes down and naters um, very, very quickly over the first couple of years, which is very encouraging. And this is a paper that everyone's been awaiting, currently in press, and I think uh, will receive a lot of interest in the medical community. He was able to show that um, the quality of life with regard to urinary symptoms, rectal symptoms, and ease of treatment was very, very favorable. So concluded that the early and late toxicity profile and the PSA response for prostate SBRT are highly encouraging, but believes that we should continue to accrue and follow up patients, as with all the other studies, um, and to see if this is, is durable. And I think that if it is durable, I think we've found a very, very new and exciting um, treatment um, of, of prostate cancer. And so just to compare, IMRT, very, very good treatment. That's what's considered standard right now in the radiation therapy community. Eight weeks compared to radiosurgery, a week and a half. You're giving, uh, well, we, we put the cost here. So there's a little bit of cost difference. Um, it's very expensive treatment all the way around. Uh, but pretty comparable um, with um, fairly, um, very little uh, time. And so for many busy people, um, time is <laughs> very, very important. So maybe that costs something. <laughs> so what about some of our future directions of this uh, CyberKnife radio surgery technology? I believe that many very common cancers we will be forging a frontier on. In terms of breast cancer, we have not begun to treat the primary breast um, tumors just yet, but there is a lot of interest um, that uh, uh, is swelling around the use in, in breast cancer. And so we hope to tell you sometime in the next couple of years that we're beginning to explore that a little bit more. Some of the technical issues with the machine, I think, were some of the initial limitations, but now with the open platform, I think we may be able to um, forge that frontier as well. Um, we've begun to look at other tumors like um, uh, this uveal melanoma, which is a type of eye tumor, um, and uh, usually they put radioactive plaques in uh, directly into the eye in an operative procedure or take the eye out altogether. And so um, this is a way in which we could potentially um, save the eye and be able to treat the tumor effectively. This is courtesy of one of my colleagues in um, Munich, Germany, who has already begun to um, pioneer this kind of work, um, and we are um, considering working with them um, in the near future. Um, but this one's an example of a patient's uh, tumor being treated by CyberKnife radiosurgery, and then after treatment, the tumor essentially gone. And so at eight months follow-up. So we believe this is sort of a, an area of potential um, exploration. Um, other areas that our colleagues here have been very interested in are non-cancer types of, of treatment for even things like depression um, and uh, mental illness. And so um, those are things that are coming to the, through the pipeline now. Um, we've uh, uh, begun to also treat some other non-malignant uh, conditions like um, back pain. Um, this one's just on a protocol, and again, we pioneered this sort of work here. We're not sure exactly how, which way this is going to go, but uh, this has been um, proved to be fairly effective in the patients that we've treated so far. So again, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention, and um, I also uh, hope to come back here again in the next several years and report that we're even forging the frontier even further.
gliomas, particularly malignant gliomas like, um, like uh, glioblastoma multiforme, is a very, very difficult um, disease to get, uh, to be treated with any type of technology. But yes, we have actually even conducted a, a clinical trial using the CyberKnife and um, an agent called arsenic trioxide um, to in, improve the radiation's effectiveness in patients who, whose tumors had come back after conventional treatments. And we found that um, that was safe and it probably um, bought the patient some um, period of time, but um, it is not a cure for, for that disease. But it can be used in that setting if it's recurrent. The answer is yes. Um, our group here so far has not explored that um, in, in depth, but I can assure you that there are um, many CyberKnife users across the uh, country who have uh, begun to use um, uh, this technology, particularly f uh, um, kind of similar to the lung tumors, where there are patients who might not be able to undergo surgery and who have a kidney tumor and it's isolated. Um, the question is whether or not you could use this technology in a way that's similar to surgery. And so some of my colleagues um, across the country have been, have been using that. And just to mention to you that since the time that I met the first time and gave this lecture, um, there have been a proliferation of cyber knives across this country. And, um, and so you'll find that many, many um, folks are using this in slightly different ways. But still a lot of the pioneering work um, in most of the tumors have been done here at Stanford. Actually, it's successive. So um, each um, beam is delivered, and then it shifts to another position and delivers the radiation dose to the next um, position. It is possible uh, because obviously if one um, delivers a treatment, a very long treatment with multiple beams, it could be over a period of an hour. With simultaneous treatments, one could deliver that in a matter of seconds. And then what the biology of, of that simultaneous de delivery compared to the sequen sequ sequential one and time factors um, are unknown right now. Uh, but um, I can assure you that um, people have, have raised the issue of whether or not we could deliver the beams in a little bit more efficient way. And um, that uh, actually has um, uh, come to fruition. It's not a simultaneous beam, but um, we've, uh, um, or the company has developed a device called the Iris, not named after me, even though that's my first name. Um, basically, it's a device that instead of using single circular beams of radiation, actually um, allows one to use a range of, of uh, collimating devices of different sizes. So most of those beam de delivery, if, if you use one collimator, each beam will be collimated exactly similarly. With this device, it can change uh, depending on uh, what uh, area of the uh, target is. So the treatment actually ends up going faster. And so we might get a little information about that once this iris collimator is being used. And currently, ours is being installed as we speak. <laughs> okay, thank you all very much. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.